Alaska became a state largely on the promise of developing resources to pay its own way. 
Oil and gas has been Alaska's biggest cash cow for about half a century, and for lo- nearly that long, Alaska's congressional leaders have pushed to access the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for development. When a lease sale finally happened in Anwar, the sale response was a whimper, not a roar. Does the lack of interest matter? We'll discuss the future of Alaska energy development today on Talk of Alaska. Funding for Talk of Alaska was made possible in part by the Alaska Middle Health Trust Authority and listeners just like you. Thank you. And by... Alaska Pipeline Service Company, proud of its ties to Alaska communities since 1977. Stopping the spread of COVID-19 takes all Alaskans working together. The time to act is now. Wash hands often with soap and warm water for 20 seconds. Cover mouth and nose with a mask whenever out in public. Stay six feet away from others, avoid shaking hands, and stay home when sick. These steps can help prevent the spread of COVID-19. More at covid19.alaska.gov. This message sponsored by DHSS. The views expressed on this program are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Alaska Public Media, this station, or its underwriters. Hello, it's Talk of Alaska. I'm Lori Townsend. The Trump administration made opening ANWR part of its budget proposal to help pay for the tax cut legislation that passed in the waning days of 2017, projecting it would generate at least $1 billion over 10 years. This isn't the first time ANWR oil revenue projections were used to try to open the area, but it's the only time it actually resulted in a lease sale. Only two other buyers beyond the state of Alaska bought leases at the sale earlier this month, $14 $14 million was raised. Is the lukewarm result a statement on the politics and emotions surrounding Anwar itself, or does it indicate a larger shift in thinking about development? Here to help unpack some of this is Larry Persley. Larry's worked for both state and federal government on gas line development, and he is a longtime energy industry observer. Thanks for being here, Larry. Thank you. Happy to help. And Andy Mack is a former commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources under Governor Bill Walker and also worked for the late Edward Itta when Itta was the North Slope Borough Mayor. Welcome, Andy. Do we have Andy? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Laurie. There he is. All right. We're also hopeful that both Koktovik and Arctic Village residents will call and share their thoughts today. And you are also welcome to join us. Do you think Anwar and oil development should continue to be a primary focus for Alaska in the future? Or do you think it's urgent to address climate change and reduce our carbon fuel use? How much say should people closest to proposed development have about how it's done. Give us a call statewide at 1-800-478-8255. That's 1-800-478-8255. If you're in Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422, 550-8422. You can also email us, talk at alaskapublic.org, and send questions or comments into Alaska Public Media's Facebook page, where we are streaming live today. So uh, first, give me your reaction to the lease sale. Larry, were you surprised that there were there wasn't more interest by industry? And why do you think there was not? Was it just low prices, pressure on investors, all of those things? All of the above. I'm not surprised. Actually, I'm surprised that the lease sale drew two bids not counting the state bid, I don't count that, but that the, the two private um, private entities submitted bids. No, I'm not surprised. The industry interest in Anmore has been declining precipitously because of investor pressure The turn toward, um, I guess I would call it animosity, toward Arctic oil and gas development, certainly low prices, the economics, and the fact that Developing Anwar is going to cost billions of dollars and may produce oil in 2030s. Oil and gas companies are just not looking at those kind of high-risk, high-capital, long-term investments anymore. They can't wait that long for their return on their money. So, no, it, it didn't surprise me. Andy, how about you? What was your reaction to the lease sale? And do you think it says anything about the potential for future investment in Alaska resources? 
Yeah, Lori, I, I actually was not expecting necessarily the large, you know, traditional uh, companies like the Exxons of the world to participate heavily. In fact, I, I thought it was even even back in 2017. You know, I was in in some cases the, the lead witness for the state of Alaska at the at the federal hearings held by DOI um, in the public hearing process and kind of watched it from that perspective and participated on that level. Uh, so I wasn't surprised that the big companies didn't uh, participate. I was a little surprised there wasn't um, there wasn't a, a mid-major or a, or, or a substantial play from somebody who wanted to take some of the, all of the risk that's associated with this with this project, and uh, um, and and sort of on a on a um, speculative basis lease on a larger level or a more significant level, and it would have come either for a mid mid-major or a company like Bill Armstrong, where he's gone out in some cases and, and leased large swaths of land and then punched a few holes and then tried to, you know, if the, if the well results came in well, he would then try to find a company to come in and operate. He's done that successfully in Alaska many times. I thought that was the type of um, activity we'd see in the lease sale, and we didn't. So I was surprised at the, you know, very significantly low level of, of participation. What do you think it means? Uh, will there be oil developed in Anwar based on this response to the lease sales? The state is the only one that bought any significant number of leases. Uh, how will that? How can that move forward now, or can it? Andy, you want yeah. to follow up? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I think that. I think that you know. I encouraged. Um, when I was at DNR, I encouraged the state to get involved. In fact, you know, first of all, I think I think even since the Tax Act passed in December of 2017, there's been a lot of change in kind of what I would call global thinking about energy and climate. And, and I just think that we have to understand as a state that climate change is really something that mainstream folks across the globe are thinking about. So a couple of things have happened. Um, first, the financial institutions like Goldman Sachs all made announcements about their unwillingness to participate and invest in greenfield activity in the Arctic. And I think that did have an effect. And uh, uh, that's a, those are policy and somewhat political statements by those financial institutions. And I think that is something that every Alaskan, I've been asked about this, every Alaskan has to understand that that has an impact. I don't think it dries up all financial support for projects in the Arctic, but I think with respect to this particular little patch of the world, why would you take, if you had a billion dollars, take your billion dollars and throw it into this area of the world, not knowing whether you were ever going to be able to, to, to drill a well? The other thing people were watching carefully, too, is after the Tax Act was passed in December 17, there was an effort to go out and shoot seismic, and it was a collaborative between ASRC, KIC, and a company that's done a lot of seismic activity in the Arctic called SA Exploration. And they just put a permit application in in 2018, and they tried to get their permit application approved. In the Trump administration, they were unable to get a, size, a permit to go shoot seismic in the 1002. That's one of the lowest impact activities associated with oil and gas. And I think industry insiders, people watching this carefully, thought to themselves, if you can't get a permit to shoot seismic, which is fundamental to your program, what does it mean if you want to go get a permit to drill a well or to put a gravel pad in and a road in to get your trucks and your drill rigs to the area that you want to drill? So I think there's a whole combination. There's climate. There's financial and financial institutions making statements. And then there's just the basic fundamental process of going about getting your permits and industries watching this stuff very, very carefully and doing some internal calculations. Larry, follow up there. How much of the decisions that companies make do you think comes down purely to the projected price per barrel of oil and how much influence do environmental organizations, indigenous activists and pressure on investors have in deciding where to explore and develop next? Yes, to all of it. I mean, certainly the, the projections on price of oil determines how much money they can allocate for capital, for new projects, for well work overs in existing fields or new developments. 
So the, the price, their projections on price tell them how much they have to spend over the next several years and also dictates what kind of return they want, how quickly they have to get it back to be an ongoing business. This, you know, oil companies always have to make enough money to pay that year's expenses and next year's investment so that there is something next year. But then on the second half of that, the growing investor pressure, political pressure, uh, environmental group pressure does factor into it. And like Andy said, you're an oil and gas explorer. You look at it and you say, is this ever going to get permitted? Can I afford the hassles and the long lead time and the litigation? And boy, I'm just going to go look somewhere else. So economics and the changing politics of a, a country of a world that is looking upon greenhouse gases, climate change, a lot, um, a lot more seriously than it did a couple decades ago. Yeah. So yes to both. So. Andy, kind of following up here on the question of Anwar, when you were first DNR commissioner, you spoke on KTOO's program Capital Views about a flattening of production as a good thing rather than decline. That was more than five years ago. And given the extremes that we've seen in oil price fluctuation and now a new administration about to take office, what do you think will happen? Uh, and first, in the context of Anwar, do you think that development will actually take place there uh, sometime soon? Or as you noted, if they couldn't get a seismic permit under the Trump administration, what are the prospects under a Biden administration for this now? I, well, I, I honestly think that if you were a company and you went to your team and you said, hey, let's look at that lease sale in the 1002, and you realized that the Biden-Harris administration was coming in in January, and you looked at their statements around climate, and you looked at who was coming in as their team of administrators, uh, that would probably leave great question in your mind whether you could get the seismic permits, get the, you know, the fill permits from the Corps of Engineers, get the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, incidental harassment authorizations to go out and do things around, around uh, marine mammals and otherwise. And so I think that the best, I, I want the, the, the most positive place that I could go with this question is this, is I think the state over a long period of time, if it understands all of the implications of what I think, even in the Trump administration, the attitudes and approaches of the American people have been changing about climate. And it's it's a mainstream concept and climate change is not gonna it's not gonna be a ton of debate about it. People are, have accepted that, you know, that, that things are happening and we can have an impact. And 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 I think that's right. And so we have to as a state kind of just understand that. And I think I think that um, the state is best positioned to go and to work with the good folks that live in Koktovik who generally um, want to see safe and responsible development. Not everybody. There's a mixed opinion, but generally that's where the community's at, people in the Arctic. And I think we need to do a really super good job of going into the communities, Arctic Village and Venati and places like that, where they're very concerned about their lifestyle and subsistence and, and make – real impactful and, and, and durable decisions that they might feel a little more comfortable about this. And, and, and I'm really just talking about how we deal with this internally because at a national level, people hear all those voices. They hear the voices of people that live in Koktovik and Gavik and Arctic Village and Inatai. And sometimes I'm not entirely sure that we Alaskans take them as seriously as we should. I think I think we try, but um, I think I think th th those are very important voices. They're indigenous voices that have real live experience around subsistence and activity, and 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 they're, they're, we have we have to really really focus on 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 those those folks and understand what their concerns are and do everything we can. So I think there's a path forward, but I think it's probably going to come from the state, and I think it's going to take a long time. Uh, and the state may at some point choose to do something novel, like 
if they've got an interest in the 1002, whether that can be exchanged for other opportunities and um, in other areas of the world or of the state. And and I want to follow up uh, here in a little bit about the concern with the first people of Alaska and their thoughts about this. But Andy, as an attorney, what can the incoming Biden administration do to, if they decide to try to stop Anwar development, what could they do beyond offering to buy back leases? Do they have any other legal leverage? Yeah, I don't think it's, it's, yeah, Lord, it's a good question. And I think, I think what you see in these situations is you see administrations um, make the terms of getting a permit so onerous that it becomes untracked. And as Larry said earlier, you just, you've got a billion dollars, you have $5 billion, and you're just, the question is, where do you spend that, that money? And if the permit package is so onerous and so expensive and the return on that investment is so speculative and limited by the permit terms itself, then, then you just kind of lose interest and you go away, you know? And, and I think, so I don't know that they, you know, listen, the, the 2017 Tax Act embedded in it and why it's pretty powerful is that there's two lease sales required until federal law changes there's going to be a second lease sale in the 1002 right um that's the law of the land now and, and that's what we saw was the first of the two lease sales which are required under federal law um there's a whole series of permits out there that are required and if the federal administration, the incoming federal administration, wanted to, quote, stop development, they wouldn't say it like that. What would they, they would do is, is they would simply look at those permits, and they would start adding conditions into those permits, and they would start limiting the scope of those permits, and they would take their time in evaluating those permits. And by the time, you know, a year or two passes on a permit application, and you can't even get a response from the agency, and then when you do see the permit, you can't believe you can only shoot seismic, for instance, in a very, very small area. And, and then, you know, pretty soon you start thinking to yourself, well, is this really going to be worth our while? And you go to a different area of Alaska or a different area of the world with your money. Mm -hmm. If you're just joining us, this is Talk of Alaska, and we are talking about the Anwar lease sale and also the state's energy future. Our guests today are Larry Persley, longtime oil and gas industry observer and former federal gas pipeline coordinator, and Andy Mack, who was the DNR commissioner under Governor Bill Walker and is a former North Slope Borough mayor, advisor, and council. You can join our numbers statewide if you have questions or comments at 1-800-478-8255. That number again is 1-800-478-8255. If you're in Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422, 550-8422. You can also email us, talk at alaskapublic.org, or drop questions and comments into Alaska Public Media's Facebook page where we're streaming live. Larry, follow up there, your thoughts um, about uh, about all of this that uh, Andy was just talking about the federal government potentially slow rolling permits and, and other things. What, what do you think we'll end up seeing here uh, if there will ever be oil getting pumped out of the ground in Anwar? Well, I don't think you're ever going to see a drill rig in Anwar. I, I, I really believe that. And Andy's right. Look, yeah, maybe the federal government under the Biden administration would say, okay, here's your seismic permit, and um, you look at it and you read it and you realize it's only good on February 29th in a leap year. Come on. Of course, they could make it so difficult, as Andy explained, a company's going to sit down and say, gee, I have some capital money I could spend next year. Do I want to throw it against a wall for permits I may never get and a project I probably could never get permitted and investors will skew me, skew me forward. I want to go somewhere else with it. So I think, um, look, North Slope will be producing oil, I believe, for decades to come, but it's not going to come out of Anwar. The world's changed and we need to get used to it and accept it. And, and as Andy explained, look at what can be done under the assumption maybe there are some some compensation that we could get from the federal government for the indigenous people if that source of revenue is not going to be there. We need to think differently than just, I want a drilling rig there and I'm going to wait for the next president to flip the rules again. How 
there's a lot facing the incoming administration, of course. Uh, there's been some speculation that the Biden administration may move kind of quickly on, on things such as the leases, the lease sale in Anwar. How likely do you think that is in the early days of the new administration? There's so much on the plate, uh, on the federal side. Uh, do you think this will be on the radar anytime soon? Andy or Gary, well, go ahead. Well, I was going to say um, just real quickly, and I'll let Andy answer the rest. I think the first, we still got, what, one day to see if the Trump administration signs the Anwar leases. I haven't heard if they're going to get the signature on those leases or not, or if the Biden administration comes in and there's no signed lease, it's a lot easier, easier for the new administration to make it go away. And I'll defer to Andy's better wisdom on that than mine. Interesting. Andy? No, I agree with Larry. I think I think there there's some outstanding questions now in the current administration. You know, now listen, I think that the, the federal law now called for two lease sales. We've had one of those lease sales. And, and that's the power of what happened in December of 2017, is that instead of a lease sale being embedded in some sort of administrative process, this is a lease sale process that's embedded in federal law. Until that law changes, this is what's called for. Um, and I, I think there, there's some legal problems, and I think that somebody will sign those leases at some point, but I'm not entirely sure. that, that That's an outstanding question. Um, and, and I think that, that, you know, I think I've felt for a long time um, growing up here in Alaska that, you know, the state of Alaska itself should be more, as a participant, be more active in the oil and gas industry. You know, I've, I've had a lot of people who are really super good friends of mine um, say, Andy, that's a private sector activity. But across the globe, you have, you have you know, national oil companies, you know, Aramco and, and, and for the Saudis and Repsol for the, you know, the French and any for the Italians, British Petroleum, you know, uh, uh, excuse me, I said Rep- Repsol is a Spanish company. Um, but the, the bottom line is I think the state has the best chance of getting in there right now under the global geopolitical circumstances and saying, hey, we've got an interest here. And part of that interest, and Larry brought up a very, very good point, part of the interest is uh, tied to uh, ANCSA. And that's really critical and very important. Um, and part of it's tied to the state of Alaska. And there either has to be some activity and the government has to, you know, the federal government has to allow some activity to move forward. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting it would be easy, but uh, um, if not, then there has to be some accommodation and there has to be con- some, some compensation for um, ASRC, Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, and Kafka Nubia Corporation and the state of Alaska. Remember, we're a under the federal law passed in 17, we're a 50% royalty interest owner there. So we would not only enjoy the production tax benefits, but we'd also enjoy the royalty there. And right now, when you look at the revenue coming into the state of Alaska as a result of oil and gas activity, it is heavily skewed towards the royalty end of things. The way the tax system works, um, it's not quite as lucrative, certainly not at lower prices. So, so I, I, I tend to agree with with Larry that the, the odds of this happening in a private sector manner in the traditional way is pretty low. And and are you saying uh, is in in the realm of compensation? Are you saying that if the federal government says, you know what, we're we're just going to make it difficult to impossible for you to actually develop these leases? that the state should be able to say, well, we would have made this much money off of that, so now, federal government, you need to compensate us for not allowing us to develop that resource, similar to what Congressman Don Young said about the the Pebble Mine prospect. He said if the Fed is going to uh, not allow that to happen, then they should compensate the state for lost revenue. Do you think that that is a viable argument for the state to make in Anwar? (laughs) <laughs> That's a good question, Maury. And it is, it is almost precisely the same question that uh, the congressman asked about Pebble. And here's the thing. When the state became the state, everybody knows we bargained for 105. We ended up with about 105 million acres of land selections within Alaska. And then there was this kind of, 
you know, over the years, there's been a whole myriad of decisions around the North Slope and, and one in particular. But at the end of the day, we ended up with a 50% royalty interest. So we own 50% of the oil, the value of the oil. And if it's not ever going to be produced by a result of federal decisions, then I think the state should be allowed to look elsewhere on the North Slope, maybe into the National Petroleum Reserve, NPRA. Um, maybe into the shallow waters just offshore in places where there's been development like North Star, Ugarook, um, Mackay Chuck, and, and be able to, you know, exchange its interest in Anwar for other interests. I think ASRC and Coctoba Canupia Corporation should be allowed to do the same. Mm. They selected those lands. That's that's their you know, that's their village lands, right? And every you know uh, ASRC is heavily um, has has a huge interest in that area, as does KIC. That's very important to recognize. All right, Larry, yeah, thoughts? I think we also need to keep in mind Congress would have to appropriate funds for any kind of lease buyback or payback. That's going to be tough to get out of this Congress. Correct. Absolutely. Let's uh, go to the phones for a, mom- a moment. Phoebe is in Fairbanks. Hello, Phoebe. Hi. How are you guys doing? Good. Did you have a question? Good. I do, yes. Um, my question is, uh, people like Ada describe the Arctic Refuge as a long-term investment, um, but, you know, the more we spend on oil, the more we're going to lose in the long term. Climate change is costing us millions of dollars already, um, and it's going to cost us so much more if we don't follow the rest of the world in moving off of oil. Um, you know, we have six villages already in need of imminent relocation, um, and relocating even one of those villages will cost more than we would ever get out of the refuge. Um, so my question is, uh, why isn't ADA spending our public funds um, to take concrete steps towards transitioning off of oil instead of investing in a dying industry? Well, that's a great question, Phoebe. I don't know that uh, Larry or Andy can really answer that. A- any thoughts, Andy? You worked in state government. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good question, and and the thing about it is, is, you know, if I had, if if I could, if I were in control and could just make any decision, I would have thirty years ago established a, a state of Alaska oil company that would have participated, not as a competitor to the companies that have been producing oil, but as a supplement to what was going on. In other words, when there was a an issue that private industry was not interested or didn't find credible, then I would basically, I would have had, you know, I would have allowed this state state entity to um, to participate in that lease sale. Um, now, so, so ADA participated in this most recent lease sale. And I think the, you know, the thing that we have to understand is this is, over a very long period of time, we are definitely in a transition. And we are in a transition away from, uh, uh, you know, coal. You know, when I was traveling with Governor Walker and we were talking about gas and we'd go to places, and Larry's very familiar with this, we'd go to places like Japan, they would lay out in very vivid form their sources of energy. Coal was one and it was disfavored and they were trying to wean themselves and get away from coal as quickly as possible. Um, oil was still on the table, and they wanted to make sure they had oil security. In, in other words, they had enough barrels of oil to, to meet their energy needs as a country. Alternatives, you know, LNG, um, uh, nuclear were all on the table. And we are, as a globe, in this incredibly long transition to another, uh, to other forms of energy. But at the same time, we also have to be very practical. But there's a very, you know, there's there's a conflict between the state of desire to, to stop producing carbon producing energy and to start using other sources of energy. And there's this, you know, conflict between what is desired by many people and the reality on the ground and price and availability. And, 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 you know, so, so we're in this very long transition, but it does not happen overnight. It's going to literally happen over decades and I think people have to be very practical about it. And, and, uh, but it's a very good question. Well, and I want to uh, talk more about that. We'll drill down a little bit there. After we take a quick break, Talk of Alaska will continue with a discussion about the future of oil and energy development and the best path forward for Alaska as Talk of Alaska continues statewide. 
Talk of Alaska is brought to you in part by your local public radio station. How are COVID vaccines made, tested, and approved? COVID vaccine development and testing happens at the same time. No steps are skipped. Vaccines go through several clinical trials, starting with a small group of volunteers, then thousands. A team of medical experts examine trial results, authorizing it for use if it works and is safe. Go to covidvax.alaska.gov to learn more. This message sponsored by the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. Welcome back to Talk of Alaska. We're discussing the future of Alaska's energy uh, income, how much should be oil and gas, and how much should be looking toward alternative methods of creating energy and uh, jobs and financial security for the state. It's going to be, as Andy Mack, one of our guests noted before the break, a long transition. We have Larry Persley, longtime oil and gas industry observer, on the line with us, and Andy Mack, former DNR commissioner under Bill Walker, Governor Bill Walker, and a former North Slope Borough mayor advisor. You can join our conversation statewide at 1-800-478-8255. That's 1-800-478-8255. In Anchorage, the local number is 550-8422. 550-8422. You can also email us, talk at alaskapublic.org, or drop questions, comments into Alaska Public Media's Facebook page where we're streaming live. We do have a few questions by Facebook and email that I'm going to get to in just a moment here. But um, setting Anwar aside, we talked a little bit about this, but where are some of the most promising areas for Alaska resource development as we're still in this era of needing oil to fill the pipeline and and uh, keep that going for into the future. Where where do you see the, the the bright spots in that regard? Is it NPRA, Point Thompson? Where 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 are you looking, Larry? You want to start off? Well, I'd say we can look at the success ConocoPhillips has had in NPRA, and they've done very well. Uh, CD five Greater Moose's Tooth, um, and the, the Willow Prospect. Also west of Prudhoe Bay, we see oil search with the Pika units. So I think there's good prospects out there that don't encounter the same in opposition that you're seeing in Anwar. Hill Corp is looking at doing well workovers and trying to get more oil out of Prudhoe Bay, the fields that they have taken over from BP. So I see prospects out there, and I'm sure I'm missing some that probably Andy's more familiar with. Andy, your thoughts? No, I think Larry's right. I think I, I think, you know, I was going to answer the question that I really am looking forward to seeing what Hillcorp does at Prudhoe Bay itself, which is our, you know, legacy anchor field. And I think um, they've proven in many cases they can generate more production out of, you know, legacy fields. And so I'm pretty excited to see what happens there because, you know, we're still in the short in a short period of time since they took over operations there. And then Larry, you know, hit the hit the highlights there. I think there's a lot of activity out west. Um uh, Conoco's had tremendous success at GMT1, GMT2, Willow. Um, there's some prospects beyond that that are currently under lease and pretty well known. And uh, they've worked through the federal permitting process in many cases uh, thoroughly. You know, there's there a recent uh, unit formed by Shell, too, in the shallow water in Harrison Bay as well. So, um, you know, there's some there's some activity in that area of the world. Were you surprised, Andy, start us off here, were you surprised when BP sold its leases within Point Thompson, Milne Point, and in Prudhoe Bay to Hillcorp and, and left Alaska? And do you think future development will be more in the realm of smaller companies rather than the big producers? I was not surprised that BP left, and there were two big indicators. One was their... Um, lack of interest in uh, doing anything on the oil side, which would require new wells and new exploration. 
Uh, they had not had an exploration program, you know. At the time they left, they hadn't had one for 10, 15 years. And mm. so they were really just harvesting. The other thing, too, I had some special, you know, some, some insight because I was working with Governor Walker and, and Lieutenant Governor Mulatto on the gas pipeline. We had invited uh, Bob Dudley, who was head of their company, to come to Juneau on a couple of occasions. They were very interested in establishing value for the gas. I was never entirely certain whether they were interested in monetizing it, but they I think they had in their mind at the time that they knew that they were probably going to be stepping out of Alaska, and they wanted to make sure they got value in the transaction for the gas. And if they could show that it was going to be monetized and it had a book value that the buyer would have to account for, you know, uh, you know understand, and, and this happens with every governor and every DNR commissioner is, you know, you would be meeting with the Bob Dudleys and the Jeff Hildebrands of the world, you know, and um, I noticed in those conversations that um, Bob Dudley was very keen on establishing significant value to the gas at Prudhoe Bay, and Jeff Hildebrand cast doubt on whether or not AGDC or any other entity would ever be able to monetize that that asset, and ultimately they did a transaction. Um uh, but it, it didn't surprise me that they left. Um, and I think that the good news is um, the Hill Corp seems to be excited to be here. They want to be in Alaska and they're investing. Larry, any follow up there before we go back to the phones? No, I think you could, BP still needed to raise, raise cash. They were selling assets to put their money to better prospects. So, no, I'm not surprised they left. I think Hill Corp was not only the probably only. Uh, serious bidder, but the, the best bidder for Alaska in terms of being able to get more oil out of those that older field. As Andy said, I think Hill Corp has done well in Cook Inlet, and I expect they will repeat it on the North Slope. It's just going to cost more money and take more time. All right, let's go back to the phones. Rio is in Anchorage. Hello. Hello. Good morning. How are you? Good. Um, <laughs> um Good. Uh, thanks so much um, for having this conversation and for um, opening up this dialogue. I'm learning a lot here from everyone. Um, I'm calling in from Anchorage here right now. And um, so I, the lease deal in Arctic was pretty surprising to me, primarily because, like, as a young person who basically has never known a world where my future wasn't directly threatened by climate change, I kind of was still in awe that in, like, 2021, the state of Alaska is still fully committed to, like, the extractive oil industry. You know, like like Larry said, the world has changed and the conversation globally has changed around um, the climate crisis and around, like, oil extraction. So, it, you know, we all know oil is dying. It's not a question of believing that or not. It's a question of understanding the gravity of that or, or choosing not to understand that reality. So I guess my question is, you know, why do we think the state of Alaska is so committed to shackling our future to a dying economy? Like, is it a lack of faith in, you know, Alaskans who, you know, many of whom have a legacy, you know, uh, of building existing infrastructure? Is it like, is it a lack of willingness to invest in innovation um, of the best and brightest, you know, that the American can potentially offer? Or is the money that we stand to gain from this here in the next, you know, you said decades, but, you know, I'd like to think beyond just decades and hopefully for centuries, right? Like, is the, is the short-term gain from this really worth the future? You know, I, I, I also think in terms of, like, even the individual that built the engine had to walk or ride a horse a little bit before it was ready to power a car, right? So before we can get to you know, full green energy, we have to do some building, we have to do some practicing and do some investment. So so where where does the apprehension, do you think, lie in shifting Alaska in that direction? Sounds like Rio's raising sort of the, the million or billion dollar question about what well, should the future look like for Alaska and how to diversify the, the economy. It, it follows up on a question that we had from uh, a similar question from Natalie Dawson, who is in Haines and um, says... Can we rely on the revenues from oil and gas to rebuild our economies? We are faced with budget deficits so large that my small town of Haines has had to cut the hours for the public library and community pool 
we're all set to lose our DMV office under the proposed budget. Doesn't it seem like we will need a different, more diversified economy in the future? And why is it that our political leadership cannot think about change? What ideas do you have for our future economy in the state other than oil and gas? Which is similar to Rio's question, where sure. should the state go from there? Um, so answer that question for us, Andy and Larry, and we'll be in good shape. <laughs> okay. Well, I think the simple answer is we got to pay taxes, period. You know, the, the state's projected revenue for the fiscal year that starts July 1 shows almost $3.1 billion coming into the general fund from that year's draw of 5% of the permanent fund market value. So $3.1 billion almost from investment, $800 million total to the general fund from oil and gas, and about $400 million, less than $400 million, from every other tax and fee that the general fund collects. So long-term, Alaskans, if they want the services, forget the dividend for a month, if you want services, you're going to have to pay. There's no way you're going to triple oil revenues. It's just It's past. It's, it's not there. So if you're going to diversify the economy and have businesses and people working and sales, you're going to have to collect some revenue from that to pay for services, and that comes down to sales tax, income tax as to why the state, through the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority, put a bid in for ANWR saying, hey, we still want the oil industry in the state. There was an interesting column a few days ago in the Houston Chronicle, which is not you know, a far left-wing environmentalist newspaper down in Houston. And that columnist said, hey, looking at it, the way he sees it, the state of Alaska put those bids in for the leases, not so much for oil, but to try to somehow preserve the jobs that we have depended on for decades. And I thought that was hmm. an interesting comment. He's right. We're, we're clinging to something that probably isn't there anymore at the le- well, not probably isn't at the level it used to be, and we need to stop clinging and find something else to hold on to if we want that kind of job growth in the future. Andy, what are your thoughts there? Is it yeah, taxes? You know, well, I think we need to just take a step back here and understand, and Larry just just talked about it, is the budget realities for the state of Alaska. And what you can really just break it down is is this question. Um, how are you going to pay on a continuing basis for the services that Alaskan residents have enjoyed for decades? And, I, and I'll bring these up. Education, schools, a vast majority of the money, which costs hundreds of millions of dollars, to put together schools in Alaska it comes from the state of Alaska's revenue base. Health care, hundreds of millions of dollars in state money comes from the state of Alaska. And this is the health care for our family members, our friends, their ability to access cancer treatment if they have cancer, um, regular routine medical services, surgeries. Uh, what about the ability to travel and move around and the transportation infrastructure that is partially funded by the federal government, but there's a significant amount of um, investment by the state of Alaska over a long period of time. And the the question you have to, you know, every legislator right now is grappling with as they arrive in Juneau and they have their, you know, today is the first day of the legislature is every, every house member, 40 districts across the state, their people are experiencing the same problems and challenges that the people that the, that the, that the commenter from Haynes experienced, which sure. is reduction in services. So this is a very difficult puzzle. And to simply wake up one day and say, we're going to ignore and we're going to set aside the oil industry and put it in a box would create devastation in our state. Devastation. Because this is about the education of our children, the health of our parents. So All then what's the, the way forward? That, what, what do we do? We well, can't put the oil industry in a box, clearly. But we also yeah. know that uh, if, we're, if we're looking at uh, flattened production yes. as a good thing, rather than in increasing production, we've got to find other sources of revenue. What are those? Yeah. 
what I would do if, if again, if I were leader of the free world I would, in Alaska, I would say this, is we as a state need to go back and we need to go back to the issue of what is the appropriate level of taxation for the oil industry. And we should find that level. I personally believe that, um, that, that that's a very detailed and, and, and very nuanced conversation, but I think that um, that's something that we need to understand. We should take as much of that money and we should jam it into the permanent fund. People have to realize that two-thirds or more of our state's general funds are now coming, and Larry talked about it, are coming out of this huge sovereign wealth, right, right. this $70 billion fund that is spinning off incredible amounts of money. So the future, the revenue source that people talk about is the permanent fund. It is literally, you know, it's not an industry where you go tax it. It's a, it's a entity. It's this, this incredible um, investment fund, which is now able to generate on a inflation proof basis, billions of dollars annually, Mm -hmm. but we need to be very careful about it. And we need to, you know, really, you know, protect what is there because that is right now and, and all through, you know, starting, I think, in 2017 from the Walker administration's decision um, and the legislature's decision to take earnings and, earn, and, and and put them into the general fund, we are now less dependent on oil, and we are using our own earnings to run the state of Alaska. That's important. Absolutely. So it's, you know, what the questioner was asking is actually happening. We are diversifying our economy into a an economy where we're a financial institution, just like any global institution. It's not cast that way, but that's what's going on. All right. We need to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll take more calls and questions as Talk of Alaska continues. Talk of Alaska is brought to you in part by your local public radio station. One out of four Alaska high school students currently uses e-cigarettes. E-cigarettes, or vapes, can deliver high concentrations of nicotine as well as other harmful chemicals. They come in many shapes and sizes, and the large variety of flavors are appealing to teens. Regular nicotine use can have harmful effects on teens' developing brains, which can hurt their memory, learning, and attention span, and can lead to addiction. E-cigarettes are not just harmless water vapor. This message sponsored by the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services. Let's go back to the phones. Josh is in Seldovia. Hi, Josh. Hi, Josh. Are you there? Well, it sounds like he might be there, but uh, he might have a bad connection. So, uh, Josh, sorry, we're not hearing from you. Let's go. Let's stay with the phones for a moment. Uh, we're not hearing from Josh in Seldovia, but let's go to Chansey in Anchorage. Hi, Chansey. Hi there, how are you? Good. What Thanks can for having such a, a good panel to address this question. Absolutely. Did you have a, a question for them? Well, I had more a comment. I think the, the question is two questions. Should we try to find more oil and pay for uh, the expense of finding it? in Alaska, and I think that that's absurd, and we should forget ANWR because it's going in the wrong direction. It makes more sense to do Susitna Dam or the Bridge to Nowhere than it is to try to get money, more money, out of uh, spending more money to find more oil. We have four to six billion barrels of recoverable oil at Prudhoe Bay right now. We own at least 500 million barrels um, because of our royalty. Doesn't it make more sense to acquire um, a higher uh, 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 amount of oil at Crudeau Bay that is, we know is producible and, and work with somebody to try to develop some use of it besides uh, um fuel for cars hmm. rather than just spending more money and and going hunting down a rat hole that we know is not going to work because the world is going away from oil as a source of energy. 
All right. Well, thank you, Chancy. Interesting uh, proposal he's presented there. Uh, Larry, start us off. What do you think about what he had to say about going all in on Prudhoe and forgetting places like Anwar? Well, we, you know, we know oils at Prudhoe. They have they know a lot about the plumbing of that reservoir, and that's why he'll cork water in. So, you know, I, there's a lot more oil to get out of Prudhoe. So, I guess, sure, I agree with that. There's nothing to disagree on it. Um, I think that um, I guess companies like Hill Corp look for prospects like that where there's not the exploration risk, you know, where they, they know the reservoir, they have a lot of information on it. You can invest money and see a higher likelihood of getting a good return on it for them and certainly for the state through royalty and, and taxes. So mm. Makes a lot of sense. So I, I want to ask a question in our final ten minutes here, or six or seven minutes. Uh, we have a question by email from Grandet, who asks: Has the state done anything to start the process of creating and using renewable energy resources, or just concentrated on pulling as much oil out of the ground as possible before being forced to face the reality of our world and our needs for the future? Now we know there's some. Uh, certainly some great renewable energy projects in the state. So with that with that question in mind, Larry, what do you see as the prospects uh, both for renewables, uh, other renewables, and for gas sales in the future as the world tries to wean itself off of carbon-based energy? Gas is seen as the less dirty transition fuel. And as more attention is focused on climate change, will the Alaska's gas reserves become more appealing and financially viable? Okay. So two parts to that. One, I think the state has, well, I believe the state's put a substantial amount of money into renewable projects. Andy can probably address that better than me from his time as, as DNR commissioner. Yes, I think we should put more into it. Certainly the long term, if you can go to renewable, the idea is it reduces the cost. So as far as natural gas, no. I think kind of like Anwar, Alaskans need to accept there is no North Slope gas line. There probably will be no North Slope gas line. Yes, gas is cleaner than coal. Gas is cleaner than bunker fuel Mm. for ships, which a lot of ships are going to liquefy natural gas. But there is no shortage of gas in the world. There's a lot of gas out there that's easier and cheaper to get than North Slope gas. So I think, sadly... Our time may have passed on monetizing you know, North Slope gas. Oh my gosh! Well, um, let's go back to the phones for just a moment, and then we'll we'll bring Andy back for a comment before we close out here. Bernadette is on the line from Fairbanks. Hello, Bernadette, are you there? Yes, Ren Gwinzi, Jen Gwinzi. Good afternoon. Hello. Yes. Did you, uh, I know that you're with the Gwich'in Steering Committee, and so I imagine you have got some comments about Anwar. We've just got a couple of minutes left. What would you like to say today? Um, i just like to share that, you know, this is not just about animals, um, although we speak for them. This is about the human rights of the indigenous people of Alaska. You know, our land, our water, our animals, we are interconnected to them. And, um, you know, if one of them go, then we all, we lose everything. And that um, that we're not giving up, you know. Um, the, the way that they, the process was done was sloppy and very embarrassing. And so um, we're hoping that the courts will see how um, dismissive they were to us during the BLM, the process, the whole <laughs> they copied and pasted from uh, um, papers from t- like 300 miles um, on the west. You know, it, it was just a big sloppy mess. And um, they've got to understand that we have a spiritual and cultural connection to the porcupine caribou herd, who we migrated alongside for over 40,000 years. But due to climate change, um, you know, many of our communities no longer get it. Our seasonal hunters are, um, we've, we've lost a lot of them because the, the climate is not what it used to be. We, we, can't, we don't know what's going on. Um, 
times during when it's the water's supposed to be frozen, it's you know people are falling through. We have dead birds falling out of the sky. Um, a couple of years ago, we had thousands and thousands of dead fish in our lakes and rivers. On um, and our elected leadership is not bringing that nothing, but not none of that to um, to the American people. Instead, they want to continue to drill, drill, drill. I mean, it's like an addiction. There's more to Alaska than oil. Yes, and and Bernadette, thank you for your comments. We're running out of time here, and I want to give our guests a chance to respond. Um, uh, Andy, how do these interests get balanced. You, you know, we're hearing from Bernadette, who, of course, people of Arctic Village, the Gwich'in, are vehemently opposed to development in Anwar. But in Koktovik, uh, a lot of the people there are in favor of it. So how, how do we balance these things? And, and what should the future look like in that respect? Yeah, uh, Bernadette, thanks for calling in. And uh, I did have the opportunity in this process, the process of the public hearing to go to, to Arctic Village and beautiful, beautiful village. Um, and, and I'll say right up front, I agree with Bernadette that this is really human rights that we're talking about when it comes to, you know, how a, a government, a Western government approaches communities and villages and indig- indigenous groups that are there. And, and Laura, you bring it up. Th- there was, you know, when we were, we, the Walker Malad administration were, 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 looking at this issue and kind of figuring out what we would say, we did go to Koktovik on a number of occasions, and, and, and we went to Arctic Village on one occasion and talked to people and listened to people, and it's difficult because we heard different stories in those communities, and we heard different histories, and, and while there was some common ground, there was also, in, the, in their final opinion about the path forward, there, there were differences. There were there were stark differences and 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 i I think that that um the the only thing that folks can do and it's not a very satisfactory answer is to take as much as you learn in those hearings and in those conversations and jam them into um the permit process and there's a huge huge you know um gap in how a village and a person who, and, you know, and I, listen, I'm just an observer. I, I'm, I'm not a member of those communities, but there's a huge gap between how they view the world and the connectivity in this permit, right? This mm. words on a page, you know, and we have to, we have to bridge that gap and it's difficult. It's very, very difficult. You know, it's, it's a very traditional, very important world with this traditional aspect and perspective, which is hard to, hard to, hard to, hard to, pull together. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for pondering on that for a a bit with us in these final uh, minutes. It is definitely a difficult thing to try to balance. Uh, I want to thank our guests, Larry Persley and Andy Mack. On our engineering team is Dave Emmerts today and Connor Crookshank. Our producer is Adeline Baxter. On the phones and social media, Abby Collins. Next week, we'll be taking a look at the legislative session and the work that is in front of lawmakers. They got started today, and so that will be on for next week. I'm Lori Townsend. Thanks for listening today. Goodbye. Talk of Alaska is a production of Alaska Public Media, which is solely responsible for its content. Views expressed are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Alaska Public Media, this station, or its underwriters. Today's program is available online at alaskapublic.org. This is Alaska Public Media. Alaska Public Media.